Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. On today's show, I'm going to be talking to America's most popular psychiatrist. That's quite an honor. And he's a 10-time best-selling author. Most of you know him or at least have heard of him, Dr. Da Daniel Amen. Dr. Amen has spent decades researching the brain, and he's pioneered the use of a special kind of brain imaging called a SPEC scan. And it's both incredibly important and, quite frankly, incredibly controversial. And he's been using SPEC scans to really help people change their brains and their lives. His, his most recent book is Feel Better Fast and Make It Last. But he's got so many books that uh, I'm trying to catch up with him. So welcome to the Dr. Gendry podcast. It's great to see you in person. I've known you for years, but welcome. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you so much. It's a joy to be with you. And it's always funny when people introduce me um, and say it's controversial to look at the brain. You, you have to ask yourself, well, isn't it controversial not to look at the brain in people who have complex psychiatric or neurological problems? So it continues to blow me away that they think I'm controversial when psychiatrists are virtually the only medical doctors who never look at the organ they treat. So I just remain confused, but feel incredibly blessed to have done this work. So, you know, that's a, that's a great place to start. What, you know, as a psychiatrist, what drove you to say there's got to be a way of looking at the brain rather than talking to people or seeing what a drug is going to do? How, what was the impetus? So before I went to medical school, I was an infantry medic, and that's where my love of medicine was born. But then I was um, trained as an x-ray technician and developed a passion for medical imaging. And our professors used to say, how do you know unless you look? And then when I fell in love with psychiatry, I went, well, of course we should look. The brain is our organ. I mean, you know, Freud knew that. Freud was actually a neurologist. Uh, the brain is our organ. And how do I know if your depression is due to head trauma or toxic exposure or inflammation or your brain works too hard or not hard enough? And so early on, even in medical school, I was agitating. We should look at these patients to assume you know what's going on based on symptom clusters. Well, as a cardiothoracic surgeon, you wouldn't operate on people unless you knew the map. So why am I gonna throw darts in the dark medications at you if I don't have a map? And so in 1987, I started doing a study called quantitative EEG, and I really like that. But in 1991, I went to a lecture on brain SPECT imaging. SPECT is a nuclear medicine study. Cardiologists use it all the time to look at the heart. And when we started looking at the brain, it just revolutionized everything in my life. So Unlike an MRI or a CT scan, those are anatomy scans. They show what the brain actually physically looks like. SPECT looks at function. And the, the most exciting lesson we learned is I can see what's going on, and if I can see it, I can change it. And that has really become the mission of my life. You are not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better. And I discovered that many of the medications I was taught to prescribe um, actually made the brain look worse, where things like diet and exercise and simple supplements made it better. And I remember in medical school, first do no harm, use the least toxic, most effective treatments, and it's just made me a warrior uh, for the health of your brain. So there's, a, there's an epidemic of dementia going on. That's rather obvious. Most of us you know, know a family member or a friend. Certainly, I take care of a number of patients. 
can you can you spot with a spec scan things that are going to number one predispose to developing dementia and number two can you see something coming and then change that course? Well, so I have a book called Memory Rescue and I'm so excited about it. And the idea behind it is if you wanna keep your brain healthy or rescue it if it's headed to the dark place, um, we can tell on scans years, often decades before you have any symptoms if your brain is headed to the dark place. And how you reverse that is you prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And we know what they are. And just speaking of the science, there's over a thousand references in memory rescue. And SPECT can tell, and this has been published, there's over 1,200 scientific studies on SPECT and dementia of one form or another. And you might know in the scientific literature, they're talking a lot about amyloid imaging. And amyloid imaging will tell you Alzheimer's or not, where SPECT will actually give you a differential diagnosis of nine different things. So SPECT can say, well, is it head trauma? dementia, or Lewy body dementia, the dementia that goes with Parkinson's disease, right. or is it normal pressure hydrocephalus, where your ventricles are too big because your brain's under pressure? Is it a toxic, like alcoholic dementia, or infectious disease, which we're talking about now more than ever before? And so, you know, it's one of the reasons why I love SPEC. People go, oh, there's no science behind what Dr. Raymond does. And, you know, I just like go, do you read? I mean, today on PubMed.com, if you type in brain spec, you'll get 14,000 scientific abstracts. It's just people don't know because psychiatrists aren't used to looking at the brain, so they've not been following the science like I have because, quite frankly, I've been obsessed with it for nearly 30 years. A psychiatrist who's obsessive. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel about that? <laughs> I feel awesome. All right. All right. So help me. How does a, how does a psychiatrist interact with a neurologist? Like you said, Freud was actually a neurologist to, to start with. Are, are you talking the same language to each other? I mean, for instance, uh, we were talking off camera about Dale Bredesen. Um, and I had on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, uh, Grain Brain, uh, Dr. Perlmutter. Uh, I think there's a lot of commonality be between psychiatry and neurology. Uh, do, your, do your colleagues in neurology feel the same way or is that where the controversy is uh, with using spec to look at this? Well, I think Dr. Perlmutter and Dr. Bredesen are friends in forward thinking. Uh, Grain Brain actually talks a lot about psychiatric issues. And, you, you know, I think the sad thing was psychiatry and neurology got divorced a long time ago. And that was a mistake because most psychiatric problems are in fact brain problems. In fact, uh, I'm working on a new project called The End of Mental Illness because quite frankly, I hate the term mental illness. Um, it's stigmatizing, it stains people, and it's basically the wrong paradigm. Um, when I told my dad in 1979 I wanted to be a psychiatrist, he asked me why I didn't want to be a real doctor, why I <laughs> wanted to be a nut doctor and hang out with nuts all day long. And there's that stigma uh, among psychiatrists. My wife, uh, who we talked about, uh, neurosurgical ICU nurse, she trained at Loma Linda where you were at, and she said she almost canceled her first date with me when she found out I was a psychiatrist because she thought they were all crazy. So there's this noise about it. So no one wants to see a psychiatrist. No one wants to be labeled as defective or crazy or abnormal. But 
everybody wants a better brain. So what if mental health was really brain health? And if we reimagined it, we wouldn't be engaging in brain healthy habits. So get this, brand new study out of Australia, two remote islands. One has fast food on it, one does not have fast food on it. The island with fast food had lower omega-3 uh, levels in their blood, so their omega-3 index was significantly lower, and the level of depression was four times. So food matters. But w we weren't taught as psychiatrists anything about food. It was only when I started looking at, well, how do I make brains better, that I came to the idea, well, you gotta get your food right, because if your food's not right, the physical organ, your brain, is not going to be right. So it literally began to transform all of my thinking. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, when I, uh, when I had Dr. Perlmutter on, his point, which is well taken, is there is no cure for Alzheimer's, period. There is no treatment for Alzheimer's. But there, it is a completely, almost completely preventable disease. As I agree with you, a huge amount of mental health is probably preventable with you know, diet and lifestyle. So take me through how do you how do you take someone who wants to have the best brain possible? Give me some action steps so people listening to us or watching us say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna take this away uh, and I'm going to feel my, my brain's gonna feel better fast. Uh, what, what can I do? So in Feel Better Fast, I have this mnemonic I like, Brain Excel. And it is basically the program we use here at Amon Clinic. So the first thing you do is you get your brain right, because when your brain works right, you work right, and when it doesn't, you don't. And there are actually um, nearly 100 tiny habits. So what's the smallest thing you can do today that will make the biggest difference? And the tiny habit for brain health, three seconds, is before you go and do something, you just ask yourself this question is this good for my brain or bad for it? And then you just have to know the lists, right? Alcohol, it's just, it's not a health food, right? It drops brain function and people who drink every day have a smaller brain. Uh, there's a study out of Johns Hopkins. And when it comes to the brain, it's the only organ where size matters. Um, Exercise is good. Vegetables, especially colorful vegetables, are good. Omega-3 fatty acids are good. Oranges are great. Orange juice, it's bad because it's unwrapped fructose and it's way too much sugar, which turns out to be pro-inflammatory for you. So if you know the list, that becomes really important. So we talk about how to get your brain right how to get your mind right. So the R in Brain XL is your rational mind, and you can train that to help you. For most people, it hurts them. And so the tiny habit, whenever you feel mad or sad or nervous or out of control, write down what you're thinking. Ask yourself if it's true. So I teach people how to kill the ants the automatic negative thoughts that steal your happiness. And um, another tiny habit I love is start every day with today is going to be a great day. Because if you do that, you begin to train your mind to look for what's right rather than what's wrong. And then you end the day with what went well today. And research has shown in three weeks that will just increase your level of happiness. Those two very tiny habits will increase your level of happiness. Yes, you can take Prozac, but it's got all sorts of side effects. And once you start it, you can't stop it. You know, once you start, today is going to be a great day. You're not going to want to stop it. Um, the A in Brain XL is attachments. You know, it's just the thing our relationships, when they're good, they make us super happy. And when they're bad, sometimes they make you want to kill yourself. Um, and so I teach people after 40 years of being a psychiatrist, well, 
what are the most important things? And I teach them to go, okay, what's your goal in your relationship? So mine with my wife is very clear. I wanna have a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship with Tana, but I don't always feel that way. So I always want it, but I don't always feel that way. So if I'm gonna engage my frontal lobes, I ask myself, does my behavior get me what I want? So if I have this rude thought that just popped into my head, well, does that help me or does it hurt me? <laughs> so attachments are really important. I actually, there's a scientific process of forgiveness that I include in the book that's just so special. I is inspiration. We're basically wearing out our pleasure centers in this company with our, in our country with our gadgets and social media. And I try to get people in touch with what's passionate and purposeful for them because it actually will push on your pleasure centers in a positive way. N is nutrition. Um, X is the X factor. What are the big lessons we've learned from imaging? We have a database now of 150,000 scans on people from 120 countries. So yes, my colleagues think it's controversial, but literally people from all over the world seek out our help, especially if what they've done has failed. So that's typically we see treatment resistant people and we publish our outcomes. We have better outcomes than anybody in psychiatry because we look at what we do before we do it. And then the last one is my favorite uh, part of the book. It's love. You do the right thing, not because you should. Um, I mean, nobody does that, right? God said <laughs> you shouldn't go to the tree. The next scene, Adam and Eve are at the tree. Right? No. It's like you, you, you do the right thing because you get to stay in the garden. You do the right thing because you love yourself, your wife, your husband, your kids, your mission. You, you never do it because you should. Doing the right thing is never hard being sick. You know this. Being sick is hard. Making good decisions to optimize your health is ultimately about love. And it's not just about you. It's literally about generations of you. Now we know it's not really genetics, it's epigenetics that your habits turn on or off certain genes. They make illness more or less likely. Yes, in you, but also in your babies and your grandbabies. I have a new granddaughter who's seven months old. Her name is Haven. She's just so beautiful. And when Haven was born, think about this. Haven is a little girl. She was born with all of the eggs she'll ever have in her ovaries. Little girls are born with all of the eggs she'll ever have. So her habits, her diet, her level of stress, her infections are turning on or off certain genes, making illness more or less likely, yes, in Haven, but also in Haven's babies and Haven's grandbabies. It really should give us all pause to say, look, you know, it's not about me, it's about generations of me. Yeah, that's true. You, you know, the, uh, the Dutch famine study uh, really was one of the best studies to prove the impact of epigenetics. And just for people who don't know that study, uh, the Dutch during World War II were blockaded by the Germans and they literally were starving to death. And women who gave birth uh, following that famine, the children uh, were actually predisposed to obesity and diabetes. Uh, because they reset their genes to seek out food because that didn't, they basically, their genes didn't want this to happen to them. But what's so interesting is those children's children, and now the third generation, is also being impacted by what happened in the 1940s, imprinting epigenetically on those children in the womb. Uh, it's just, it's scary, but it's also, you're right, I think empowering, because if, if we understand really from the get-go uh, what's going to happen, even as babies, uh, I have two young grandchildren, and thankfully my, my daughter and her husband uh, follow my program, and they actually 
raise their kids with the plant paradox method and because they get it and they go oh my gosh you know you know what have we done what what did my father do to me <laughs> when i was a big fat guy so but you're right it's 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 scary how much we now understand it's not our genes it really isn't genes have very little to do about all this it's the imprint on those genes from epigenetic from food from lifestyle uh, that's going to make all the difference Speaking of making the difference, what do you, give me your thoughts about sleep. Uh, how important is it? How impactful is it on our mental health and also on preventing dementia and memory loss? So in Feel Better Fast and Memory Rescue, I talk about this one idea. If you wanna keep your brain healthy or rescue it, if it's headed to the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors. And I have a mnemonic I love called Bright Minds. And so B is for blood flow, and R is retirement and aging, and I is inflammation, and the S is sleep. Because what I've seen is people who get less than seven hours of sleep at night have lower overall blood flow to their brain, which means more bad decisions. People who have sleep apnea, they snore loudly, they stop breathing at night, their brain actually looks like they have early Alzheimer's disease. It begins to kill the tissue in their parietal lobes, top back part of the brain, which is one of the first areas that dies in Alzheimer's disease. And then new research has shown that when you sleep, your brain cleans or washes itself. It's basically cleaning up the amyloid plaques that are building up in the brain, and so making it a priority is critical. And in 1900, on average, Americans got nine hours of sleep at night. Now in 2018, they got six and a half hours of sleep at night. You can't go through that kind of radical change um, in such a short period of evolutionary history and it not have a negative impact on our well-being. Children who average one less hour of sleep at night have a higher incidence of suicide. So we need to be more thoughtful and make sleep a priority in our lives. Okay, give me one action step to get more sleep. Everyone who's listening to us going, oh, that's great for you to say, but you know, I'm working two jobs and I got three kids and I'm stressed out at night and I'm staring at my TV screen and the last thing I wanna do is go to sleep. So turn blue light blockers on every gadget that you, your eyes look at after dark. Um, so, you know, phones have them, computers have them, you can download simple apps for them. Uh, that way you're not going to be bombarded with the blue light that turns off melatonin. Also, don't eat two hours before you go to bed because people who eat right before they go to bed have a higher incidence of heart attack and strokes because their blood pressure doesn't dip right before they go to sleep. So they're called non-dippers and they have a higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. And you know why I love talking to a cardiothoracic surgeon. Many years ago, I realized, cause SPECT is a blood flow study. It looks at blood yeah. flow and activity. And the number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease is low blood flow to your brain. So whatever is good for your heart, is good for your brain. And whatever is bad for your heart is bad for your brain. So taking care of your blood vessels is actually one of the most important things you can do for your brain. No, that's very true. We, uh, we have techniques to measure blood vessel flexibility in our clinic, and it's, it's fascinating. There's a saying in longevity that you are only as young as your blood vessels are flexible and that has to do with the brain as well. But we've, we've found and published that certain substances, uh, high polyphenol sub substances, like, uh, like grapeseed extract, like uh, coffee, uh, like extra dark chocolate, and olive oil has polyphenols that 
absolutely make your blood vessels more flexible. And when we add this to people's diets, their blood vessels get flexible. And then we took them out of people's diets and we could actually prove that their blood vessels got stiff again. So uh, yeah, you, you've got to have blood flow to your heart and you've got to have the same thing to your brain. You're, you're absolutely right. All right, I, I've got to get you, I've got to get you on the road to your next meeting. So um, on that same subject, what are people eating that's unhealthy for their brain? And, and give me one action step to stop that habit and start a, a better habit for their brain. So I, I love this idea. I, I mean, you know, you and I agree on the foods, right? Anything that's pro-inflammatory. So uh, Tana and I wrote a book called The Brain Warrior's Way. And in it, we talk about the weapons of mass destruction, which are highly processed, pesticide sprayed, high glycemic, low fiber, food-like substances stored in plastic containers. With 70% of us overweight or obese, 50% of us are diabetic or pre-diabetic, this is the biggest brain drain in the history of the United States. I published two studies that show as your weight goes up, the actual physical size and function of your brain goes down, which should scare the fat off anyone. So the one little tiny habit is when you go to eat something, ask yourself, do I love something that loves me back? So I don't know how many of your listeners have been in bad relationships. I have been in bad relationships in the past where I loved people that didn't love me back or weren't good for me. And I'm not doing that anymore. You know, I have a, have a wonderful woman that I adore and I'm damn sure not doing it with food that I have total control over. So when you're looking at that brownie or the donut or the cupcake, it's like that is pro-inflammatory, it's addictive, it increases erratic brain cell firing, it doesn't love you back. So you might love it, but it doesn't love you back. The only things I eat are things that serve my health rather than steal from my health. So you gotta get your mind right about this. It's not, oh, I don't miss the, the Rocky Road ice cream. I actually see it as a weapon of mass destruction. So you know you're getting well when you find, and we're all creatures of habit. Um, you know, what are the 20 foods you typically eat? I mean, people, it's like 15 or 20 foods, that's it. You just have to like, it's not hard. Just find 15 that you love, that love you back. And um, Tana has a great cookbook called The Brain Warrior's Way Cookbook. And the, last night she made me asparagus soup with chicken. And it was just phenomenal. There is no suffering in getting well. Yeah, you know, uh, I used to know Jack Lane before he, he passed on. And Jack Lane, uh, one of his favorite expressions, which I think is going too far, uh, but if it tastes good, spit it out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's not right, because you can train your taste buds. I, I mean, I love everything that I eat. I mean, you know, my snack is a cup of frozen blueberries, and I love that. Uh, so talk about polyphenols, they're just loaded with it. And, and so you just have to find things you love that love you back. Okay, so boy, we've hit all the things I wanted to hit. Uh, I, one last thing, uh, as you know, I'm fascinated with the microbiome, both in our gut and the oral microbiome. Uh, tell us, the research is evolving very, very rapidly about the gut-brain connection and even the microbiome uh, connection. Uh, thoughts on that? What, what have you learned that's changed your practice in the last few years with the Human Microbiome Project and the brain? You know, we talked about whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain. Well, whatever is good for your microbiome is good for your brain as well. There's actually a direct connection between the brain and the gut through the vagal nerve. And when you keep the gut bugs healthy, you're happier. You're actually less anxious, you feel less stress. Uh, 
and it helps to modulate inflammation. And the eye in Bright Minds is inflammation. And in that part of the book, I talk all about the microbiome and how critical it is. So you want to avoid things that hurt it. I mean, this is like, this isn't hard, right? So for the brain, do things that help it, avoid things that hurt it. For the microbiome, it's the same. Do things that help it, avoid things that hurt it. So don't take antibiotics unless you have to. Um, you, you need to like lessen the alcohol. Why did my wife as a nurse put alcohol on your skin before she gave you a shot? Because it's killing the bugs. And I'm just not a fan of murdering those gut bugs that detoxify your system, help you digest your food, make neurotransmitters, make vitamins, and so on. And then lots of fiber, because fiber actually becomes the prebiotic or the food for the gut bugs or the probiotics. Yeah, absolutely right. Perfect. All right, I do one last thing on my segment. Uh, I take an audience question, but I'll do that after I say goodbye to you. So uh, I really appreciate uh, you coming on. It's, it's great to get to know you better. Uh, we'll see you again, I hope. Thank you, Stephen. What a joy uh, to spend time uh, with you. All right, so everybody get this book and find out how to save your brain before it's too late and keep you happy. That's if nothing else Make yourself happy. Okay, so we've got an audience question. Uh, Karina asks, having such a hard time getting started with the diet, any suggestions on helping with cravings? Well, first of all, uh, cravings are completely normal as you've seen in the plant paradox and as you'll see uh, in the upcoming longevity paradox, your bad gut bugs actually control your desire for these bad foods. They actually send text messages to your brain, just like we were hearing with, with Dr. Amen, that you should feed them the things they like. And quite frankly, they love junk food. So it takes a few days for you to starve these guys. And if they don't have what they want to eat, they actually die off and leave because they no longer have that. What's fascinating is if you give your gut bugs the things they like, and quite frankly, that's lots of green stuff, lots of leaves, lots of resistant starches like yams or jicama or taro root, just to name a few, the good bugs this is what they grow on and they multiply and literally push out the bad bugs. The good bugs in turn send text messages to your brain to go get some more of this stuff. And I, and I write about uh, a lot of my real dyed in the wool meat and potato guys or people who would say I would never eat a salad in my life. About two weeks later when they come back to my clinic and see me for a follow-up, they said, this is the weirdest thing. You know, I hate vegetables, I hate salads, but now I crave them. If I go a day and I can't get a salad, I'm ready to kill somebody. And that's so unlike me. And it's literally because your brain has been hijacked by bad bugs and they, want you to keep giving them the stuff they want, but you can drive them out. So willpower is actually an important thing. And what is really useful is to have your significant other, your spouse, your brother, your sister, your, your dog be the policeman. And you say, I empower you to stop me because I'm out of control. And I want you to you know, clean out the refrigerator for me. Those are, easy, those are easy steps to do. And just say, I'm not gonna get mad at you, just stop me, I need help. And it's okay to ask for help. The other thing that I think is really easy to do is many people, we, we talked with Dr. Eamon, about 80% of Americans are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And that means 80% of us are what's called insulin resistant. And we'd spend an hour on insulin resistance, but I won't. 
What it means is that when you start taking away all these sugars that you're used to, you actually go through sugar withdrawal. Your cells can't use fat properly. You can't get into ketosis. This is what Adkins didn't know. And you go through what's sometimes called the low carb flu or the Adkins flu, where you get a headache, you feel like you have absolutely no energy, you're grouchy. Uh, the word hangry, I think, is a great term. I think one of the easy ways to get through this period of time is to get yourself some MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides, sometimes called liquid coconut oil. It can be easily made into ketones in your liver. And it's tasteless, it's flavorless. Take about a tablespoon three, di three times a day for the first few days and you'll get through those cravings. The other option is get yourself a handful of nuts and whenever a craving hits you, take some nuts. Here's a little trick, put some salt on the nuts. When we're actually actively losing weight, we diurese, we pee a lot and we pull salt out of our bodies. And there's some very good research that shows that we actually should increase our salt intake when we're first starting these programs, and it will really help with cravings. So don't be afraid of salt. Salt is not the enemy that everybody thinks it is. So having said that, uh, it's normal to go through these cravings. You're getting bad messages from the bad bugs, and you gotta starve them. And empower yourself to starve those guys. They'll leave and the good guys will take over and they'll start controlling you in good ways. All right, so that's the Dr. Gundry podcast for today. Thanks a lot for listening. The 30 day challenge is still ongoing. I'm posting just about every night on Instagram about what I'm doing. How are you doing? Why? Because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you.